This is Git Minutes episode 39, and it is the fifth and final part from Git Merge 2015. Starting to be a little while since Git Merge 2015 now, it was all the way back in April, uh, but we're finally getting around to uh, shipping up a last episode about it. Sorry for the long wait, so let's get on with it. Git Minutes is a show for proficient Git users featuring stories, discussions, ideas, and other things useful for those using Git today. I'm your host, Thomas Ferris Nikolaisen. You can find more information about the show and how to support it on gitminutes.com. This episode is recorded on the 9th of April, 2015. Oh, that's a long time ago. And the show notes are available on links.gitminutes.com slash 39. Git Minutes is hosted and sponsored by DigitalOcean. Maybe you've noticed over the last year that uh, whenever you search online for some Linux or sysadmin stuff, you end up with a tutorial on the DigitalOcean community pages. This is an amazing set of resources. And to put it into our context here, uh, they got over 30 rich tutorials related to Git alone, everything from uh, setting up a Git repository manager on your own server to uh, managing server configuration using Git, and all this knowledge is not even tied to using their services specifically. It all applies to general uh, Linux use cases. So here's a big thank you to DigitalOcean for putting all this energy into those tutorials. They are super helpful. So we've decided again to take the earnings from the last year of this podcast and do donate them to Doctors Without Borders. It hasn't been a very active year for Git Minutes, but uh, we still managed to get $750 sent their way, thanks to all of you listening to this show, and especially those who use the promo code gitminutes10 over at DigitalOcean when signing up there. If you have an account already, feel free to let them know that I'm giving you more ideas on how to use their awesome services. In this episode, I talk to Alexandra Tritz about how they use Git at BlaBlaCar. I'll talk to Rick Olsen from, from GitHub about Git LFS. That will be the large file system uh, which he announced uh, at the conference. And finally, I talk to Jeff, aka Pef King, who is one of the busiest developers on the Git project itself. Okay, so now I'm sitting here with uh, Alexandra Tritz. Hi. Uh, tell us a bit about yourself. Okay, so um, I'm working at Blablacar. I'm uh, an Android developer. And uh, I'm here to uh, learn more about Git, about uh, what others are doing, and uh, how we can improve uh, in our company. Okay, uh, Blablacar sounds a bit familiar. Uh, can you tell me what that is? Yeah, Blablacar is uh, actually a ride sharing company. Okay. We are doing uh, ride sharing mostly, and uh, it's uh, trips that are uh, about 300 kilometers. So long journeys okay. and long distances. So uh, we're connecting uh, people uh, from city to city. Okay. And uh, what does the developer team look like? And uh, I'm assuming you're, you are using Git for source control? Yeah, of course. Uh, we're using for a long time now. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, our, all, our, all of our projects are uh, on Git. Yeah. And um, we have like other, I'd say, 50 projects on Git, so uh, we, we are really used to it, and uh, we are really working uh, close, I'd say, with Git. Okay. Uh, were you at the training yesterday? No, unfortunately not. Okay. And uh, what, what, is your, what do your team members do to kind of, um, when they start to learn Git? Uh, and how do you teach pe uh, people Git uh, internally? So to speak? Um, actually, um, most of our developers already used Git uh, before uh, joining BlaBlaCar. Oh, nice. But uh, we do have a training uh, internally at BlaBlaCar. And um, it's like uh, we have, I'd say, not an expert, but someone at BlaBlaCar who really knows Git and uh, really knows the, um, like, the... Yeah, the, the, the inner workings and yeah, uh, of, uh, of Git. And uh, we made uh, an internal uh, video that we show them. And uh, if they have any question, they can go see them, see the, the, like the expert. Mm. And um, we can uh, ask any question if uh, we have. Uh, how, many, how many developers are you? Um, we have like 40 developers. 40? Yeah. Wow. 
and 50 repositories. And do you have? Are you running into any of those scaling uh, issues that uh, the speakers were talking about today? Not really. For the moment, we're uh, really like I'd say organized enough. So we don't have any problems. So you have many small repositories yeah. and not any any big ones. No, that's good. What, what do you think about this uh, tendency that Facebook and uh, Twitter are doing with putting everything into one huge repository? Well, do you see the benefit that they have from not that? Not really, because for my side, I like to keep things organized, and I like to have small folders uh, for each like small. Not feature, but you know, small work repository. Mm -hmm. So I um, don't think I'll do that in a huge project because it can become a mess really quickly. Yeah. And what about those uh, cross repository refactorings when you want to change something in, uh, in one service that another one depends on? You yeah. kind of have to commit them at the same time. Do, do you have a way to handle sort of? inter-repository uh, dependencies or relationships? Well, uh, actually, we do have sometimes this kind of problem, but um, I think we handle that well. And um, for the moment, we didn't have any big problems, I'd say, um, for this kind of uh, merging and conflicts uh, between projects. So um, we are using submodules. Oh. And um, it's not that bad actually. And Every, everybody uh, says they're so yeah. bad about the. No, uh, uh, today everyone is talking about some models like they need some love, and I'm <laughs> that kind of girl. Um, I've used some models in mm. my projects, and I think it's really great. And uh, it's not hard to put it in place, so you should really use them. That's an interesting takeaway. And <laughs> I think it's the first time somebody said that on the, on the podcast. It's, uh, <laughs> Since the last Git, Git merge, when I talked to somebody who was developing some modules, so uh, did you learn anything uh, new at the yeah, conference, or course. something uh, you want to take away? Uh, yeah, uh, I really like to know how others are doing, are doing um, in their company, and uh, it can give uh, ideas uh, for us to put in place in our company. So uh, I think these kind of conferences are a real good thing for us developers and for anyone, in fact. So yeah, it's always, I'm always learning something. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for talking with me, thank Alexandra. You. Now I'm talking to Rick Olson, AKA Technoini from, uh, from GitHub. So um, we just uh, saw your talk about uh, large file storage, uh, the implementation or protocol. Mm -hmm. uh, so. I guess listeners who should be able to go to uh, the homepage of the conference and see a recording of the talk, I hope. Yeah, I'm not sure yeah. when it's going to happen, but uh, I imagine we'll, yeah. uh, we'll uh, tweet, so, blog about it somewhere. Yeah, and it's also, well, there's also the blog post from yesterday. I guess everybody yeah, has on, heard on, about it by now. And, and, yeah, and on the uh, github.com blog, github.com slash blog. Yeah. Um, so, uh, did you kind of plan it, plan it for a long time that we were going to announce this just for Git merge? Uh, no, it's actually supposed to be launched a little bit before, but you know how things go. <laughs> and uh, I didn't want to bail on the talk, so we we're like, all right, we got to get this out before Git merge, and so we can talk about it. Um, I mean, honestly, this isn't the the right audience for Git large file storage. I don't think. Yeah. I mean, not the it's not the audience that we're pushing it towards. You know. So um, well, you said that it, it's not yet ready on github.com. Uh, yeah, you talk so more about that? This, is like a, this is a whole new service for us. So we want to be pretty cautious. Um, it's actually working. It works just fine. But we have a wait list right now to gauge interest. And there's a survey, so you can, you can tell us like, what kinds of files you want to store, like what industry you work in, that kind of thing. Um, and then we'll let people in and see what happens. You know, if it if everything burns down, we'll like stop and <laughs> figure it out. But you know, uh, otherwise, you know, we'll keep letting people in. And then uh, right now, the plan is in about two months. We'll you know open it up. Yeah, you you uh, mentioned some something about uh, new ideas or, or things where directions this could take in the future. Uh, 
Do you, ha do you have any like concrete plans or things that are, like a roadmap or a list of things that you would like to have? Uh, not really. I mean, I <laughs> I've been so busy the last couple months. Like, just <laughs> getting to this point, like this is all I can think about. Like I'm gonna get home uh, from Paris and just crash for a week and not <laughs> going to work. So um, you're going back to the U.S. or you're, you're U.S. based and just came over here for the conference? Yeah, yeah. So uh, Git LFS. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. It's there was a lot of HTTP uh, stuff there. I saw, but also a mention of SSH. Uh, does that mean that SSH was if I get clone with SSH, will that also work? Yes. So the the problem with just supporting only HTTPS is if you use SSH, then you have to learn about Git credentials and setting yeah. up a, a you know a credential cacher and. If you if you don't use it, it's kind of weird. And then if you're using uh, if you're using GitHub and you have two FA enabled, you can't even put your password in. It just oh. doesn't doesn't really work. And and it's not it's uh, and that part of that is uh, you know Git itself doesn't really know about two FA. It's just you know using basic authentication. So we needed something for SSH users so they can just get up and going. Okay, so it does work out of the box now. Or does it not for, for SSH cloning? It, it will. I mean, once we've opened up the wait list. OK. Or, yeah. And it, I can just keep on cloning the way, the way I've used to, because I like SSH. Yeah. Know? So <laughs> basically, we just re the uh, SSH command that it runs, it turns uh, like a, in a, a temporary token that we pass for the authentication. Ah, so nice. Um, so these uh, files, they're stored uh, like? In an adjacent, adjacent, what's it called? Adjacent space to to the Git uh, repository, but you also said something about being able to um, store them elsewhere or on other servers, right? So they don't actually get stored in the Git LFS server. The Git LFS server just tells you where to store them or okay. where to fetch them, and depending on the implementation, it could be like it, it could be like pointing the client. Back to itself, like maybe it implements those APIs to download and upload the content, or maybe like on GitHub.com, um, S3 already knows, you know, is really good at storing and serving content. So we just give you those links. Mm -hmm. So I, if I have a web server somewhere where I like to store my big files, I, I could configure it to, to 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 store it there, right? Yeah. So if you wanted to do that, uh, you'd have to, you know, implement. The uh, you know the API endpoints and host right. that somewhere. Okay. Uh, and and you, you can't you can use that with GitHub. Like I you know you're not going to hurt my feelings if uh, you use GitHub.com for your Git stuff, and, but then you put your files somewhere else. Yeah. Um, I, maybe I want to put them on a you know local office uh, server, which is much faster for for getting the files over to my laptop. Right. Uh, and that's fine. Uh, the goal of Git LFS is uh, for the default configuration. It just works. You yeah. don't have to worry about setting that up. And if you want to, there's an upfront cost, obviously, just setting all that up, writing the server. Uh, hopefully, there there'll eventually be open source servers that you can just push directly to uh, to uh, Heroku or you know maybe yeah. like a Docker oh, image yeah, or exactly. whatever. Um, I'm not really an ops person, so whatever whatever people do these days. Are there, um, are there any other um, like protocols that can be used for transferring uh, the big files? Right now, it's just HTTP. Um, okay. the, the really cool thing about that, though, is uh, I'm gonna, okay. Um, the cool thing about HTTP is uh, you know it's well understood how to write these APIs, and we can do. Like one of the things I'm really interested in is uh, caching servers. So maybe, yeah. um, maybe a, a team with an office in, say, San Francisco and London or, or Paris, because we're here in Paris, um, they both use GitHub.com, but they don't want to talk to GitHub.com or S3 uh, for their large files. So they they set up uh, like a caching server in the the Paris office and the San Francisco office, and that would be in charge of like. Storing, you know, caching the files locally in that office, but also pushing them upstream to uh, to GitHub. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, and uh, the nice thing about that is we can support that, and that's a fairly complicated 
you know, advanced setup, but as far as the client's concerned, it's just talking to yeah. a URL. Yeah. Um, I think it was a Twitter talk. They mentioned something about torrent uh, networks for oh. distributing large files and stuff. Is that something that could be patched into this at um, some point, maybe? Sure. Uh, the, yeah, the nice thing about the, the JSON uh, hypermedia API is we can add new uh, link Links, relations. Yeah. And, you know, they don't necessarily have to be HTTP URLs. Nice. So it's really, it's really flexible. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, was, that was some uh, feedback we got during like the pre-release a few months ago, and uh, we just, I basically like we we rewrote the whole back end with this new structure, but then now we have a lot of flexibility. Nice. So that's, I'm really happy about it. All right. Um, I'll, uh, we'll uh, we'll put a link to your uh, talk in the show notes, of course. Okay. And thank you very much for talking with me, Rick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So perhaps my last guest for the day. Uh, are you going to see the Amazon talk, uh, by the way? Uh, uh oh, I'm being recorded. <laughs> yes, I'll, of course. I'll, I'll, edit, I'll edit it out. Okay, right. Let's start over. So perhaps my last guest for the day. Uh, welcome, welcome back to the show, Jeff King. Uh, Thank AKA you, AKA Pef. Thank you for having me. So uh, let's talk about what was discussed yesterday. Um, will there be any kind of place where people can go to see all the conclusions that were arrived at at the Dev Summit? Uh, uh, there was some video taken, uh, but there wasn't, uh, there wasn't a steady video stream. I do think, uh, my hope is that uh, a lot of the, the items that were discussed are going to end up uh, making it to the mailing list, yeah. uh, because in, in our community, generally, if things aren't on the mailing list, they didn't happen. Uh, so, so I'm hoping a lot of the conversations will continue there, and I'm hoping to, uh, to move a lot of them forward. What was your like general feel about the discussions yesterday? Uh, I thought they were good. I thought there were a lot of interesting points brought up. Um, I mean, these are people who are already talking to each other, you know, uh, online. But I think sometimes getting everybody into the same room, uh, some new topics can be brought up, or some topics that haven't been uh, uh, that, that maybe maybe are recurring topics that come up every year, and we say, you know. <laughs> Getting everybody into the same room lets us uh, lets us maybe hash them out a little bit more. Yeah. Any any particular thing that materialized because of the discussions or things that you, you found yesterday? Uh, well, many things. One of the things that's most interesting to me is uh, I gave a presentation on the uh, uh, Git's relationship with the Software Freedom Conservancy uh, and the fact that uh, that Git Git does exist sort of as a legal entity that uh, that has some money and not not a lot of money. Uh, and I'm going to be posting the details of that talk to the uh, to the mailing list to sort of f further uh, let people know what's going on there. But one of the really interesting discussions was uh, whether it was possible to pay people to work on Git. That is, yeah. if you are a company that uh, depends on Git and you want to throw some money in the direction of Git to make sure the project stays healthy, uh, can you do that? And the answer today is basically no. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, but I think that's an area uh, where uh, there could be some some interesting movement forward um, uh, because uh, because Git exists as this project that could take in donation money. I don't know all of the details and the legality of us paying a developer to work on things, uh, and so we need to talk to the Software Freedom Conservancy about that. But that's exactly the sort of thing they exist to help us with, right? Mm -hmm. Is to, to to do money handling. Uh, to you know, a, a lot of bigger projects, the Pearl Foundation, the Apache Foundation, they do these things on behalf of their much much larger projects. But the idea of Software Freedom Conservancy is that uh, that many projects the size of Git aren't we're not big enough to have our own foundation, but okay. we can uh, we can use their resources and their expertise to try and uh, do things. So so I don't know what's going to happen with that, uh, but that's certainly an area that I uh, I think is an interesting uh, an interesting development that's sort of come out mm. of yesterday's discussions. Yeah, we, we talked to Ivo before on the I interviewed him before, mm -hmm. and he said that uh, there's a similar thing going down in, in the Pearl community. Right. Yeah, his company is one of the ones that uh, they I guess they give some money to the uh, Pearl Foundation, which yeah. then ends up in the hands of Pearl developers. And they'd really like to do the same thing for Git, but they have no idea how to do that. And frankly, yeah. neither do we. What about those uh, bounty source programs and stuff out there? Right. So uh, as far as I know, nobody is doing Git bounties. I've never, I don't, 
know that we've ever taken a patch that someone did as, as part of a bounty, but I also don't know if they would have told us if they were doing that. But uh, I, I, At least on Bounty Source, the, the one service that I know about that mm -hmm. does this kind of stuff, probably there are others too, uh, there weren't any registered bounties on the Git repository, at least not the one on GitHub. Um. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I really don't know if, if anyone is doing it. And I think one of the points that, that Ava brought up is that they don't, they're less interested in particular bounties. Yeah. Uh, I mean, certainly There's they have needs, but they're much more interested in saying, could we, your software is free, we pay for a lot of other software, could we pay <laughs> some money to somebody to make sure the project remains? Oh no, my recorder ran out of battery in the middle of this interview. Luckily, Pef was friendly enough to re-record after we noticed it, so, uh, so here we go where we about where we left off. So yeah, we got broken off there at some point. Um, I, last thing I can remember, uh, I wanted to ask you, what, was, what would be your favorite thing uh, to fix regarding the scalability issues uh, of, of the many that were mentioned yesterday? Um, I really would like to solve the ref storage problem uh, that, uh, you know, we originally used the file system to, uh, to store one, one file per ref, and that really doesn't scale. Um, and then we came up with this packed ref system so that you can occasionally pack these loose one per file uh, refs into one giant packed refs file. Uh, but that introduces this whole fascinating host of, of uh, locking and race conditions uh, because now you have two places you can find a ref. Uh, and the rules, the rules are set up, but there were, there were bugs in, in the Git code uh, that were fixed uh, a while ago um, that had caused problems for us. But also, the packed refs file we read as this, as this monolith. So if you want to look up one ref, you end up reading all the refs. So, so things that should be, should be constant time algorithms suddenly become, you know, order the number of refs you have. Um, wow. And that most people don't notice that, but uh, some people have very large numbers of refs. And then you start to notice, again, again every, we get all kinds of things pushed to us, so we find all the weird problems because they, they show up uh, in our performance metrics. Is this, uh, metric. is this something you see in the kernel repo, for example? No, the kernel is, is relatively sane. I mean, uh, what do you have to do wrong to get the... <laughs> uh, I don't want to name any repositories uh, specifically, <laughs> but if, for example, you make a tag for every commit, uh, for example, you uh, might end up with tens of thousands of, uh, of refs. Yeah, I think wait, you already gave them away because somebody <laughs> said that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually, I, I don't even think we're the worst. Uh, I think Google, uh, because of the way Garrett uh, manages yeah. its tags, I think they, they have it much worse than us. And I can't quite recall, do they have a solution for that or a hack that they do on their servers? I don't, I don't know uh, what they do. Um, it's, it's funny because they, they're mostly backed by JGit. Yeah. Uh, and so I think JGit has pluggable uh, backends for storing refs. Oh. Um, they, they made things, because, because JGit came about after Git, and it's a little more library uh, friendly and a little more abstracted. Uh, and so, um, so that they have, I think, for example, a, a, a pluggable object storage, pluggable ref storage. We don't have those things in Git. We're just actually now uh, uh, implementing pluggable ref storage. There's been some work from Google uh, in that area over the last six months or so. But it's because it's such a core part of the code base, it's, we have to touch it very slowly and carefully because we don't want to yeah. have any regressions. Um, I mean, Garrett can probably keep the stuff in memory on the server, right? Uh, I don't, I mean, perhaps, but uh, they they back all of their repositories on Bigtable and GFS, oh, and yeah. so I imagine that's that's where they're storing these masses of refs in, in basically a, a giant distributed database. Okay. Whereas so, at GitHub, we more or less use core, regular core Git. So with, with, an, uh, with the Git uh, core, Git executable on a client, um, there's no running process where you could kind of keep anything right. like that cache. Where would you put it, and how, how would you make it faster? If you, <laughs> or, you know. uh, well, so I mean, a, a lot of it is just uh, we've sort of invented our own database structure on disk, and it's not a very good database structure. Uh, it's it's simple and robust, which is nice, but it's uh, it's not 
efficient, right? If you want to delete one ref from a giant packed rest file with 100,000 refs, well, you rewrite the file without that one ref. Uh, and so that's a lot more work than uh, a regular key value database, which can, you know, delete one entry. Yeah. Um, so you're saying we should put a database inside the Git? Uh, yeah, well, I, I really dislike databases because of the, the reasons that, uh, because they're the opposite of, of Git scheme, right? Which is Git's packed ref scheme is so absurdly simple, you can generate a packed ref file using a shell script. Um, and you can, you know, you can cat the file and, and it's, it's very readable. But, um, but yeah, I don't think uh, we would probably roll our own database, but we could back it with uh, SQLite. Uh, we could back it with, uh, there are many key value databases uh, in existence. It's a little more complicated than that because the, uh, the ref logs are also another thing that's a scalability problem. Okay. Um, and so uh, you would want, it's not just a key value database. Uh, I think you could use some kind of log structured uh, database where you're sort of constantly appending to it and use that as both the ref log and the, and the ref storage. But uh, we're still in very early days for that yeah. kind of talk. So I'm just speaking crazy words I heard sometime on the internet. <laughs> uh, is, is this a client problem or a server problem or, or both? Uh, it's, it's both. Uh, it's really, yeah, it depends on the particular repositories. Um, I think it hits us worse on the servers at GitHub because of the way we store all of the forks for a particular uh, repository. So if you, we store not just Linus's kernel, but all of the forks of the kernel get stored in, uh, in one giant sort of shared repository. Um, and that repository has a really, really large number yeah. of, of refs. It has, it has the number of refs in each fork times the number of forks. Uh, so the more popular a large repository is, the bigger it gets. Um, so clients don't face that pain, but they do face pain, you know, um, when they just have a lot of refs in general. You know, each one of those forks, the client is impacted. Yeah. So, um, what would it be, or how much effort would it be to make a pluggable uh, ref uh, pack file for Git core? So for pluggable refs. Yeah, oh, to, or, be, to be able to switch out uh, the file with the right. database at um, will or configuration. So the uh, the major work in that was that the assumption of the existing format was uh, littered throughout the code. I mean, there were places where the code would touch the file system to you know to do these things, and there was a big push uh, uh, starting last summer uh, from Ronnie Salberg, who was at Google at the time, to do. Um, uh, to, to sort of clean these up, push everything into one abstracted idea of this is the ref database. Um, and uh, that work has been continued by uh, Stefan Beller, who is also at Google. Um, and I think we're at a point now where most of that cleanup has happened, uh, and it's just a matter of those, the patches. He, uh, Ronnie even had a proof of concept pluggable back end. Oh. Uh, and, uh, but of course, it, there are always, there are always uh, corner cases and details, right? And so those patches have taken a long time to filter through to upstream. But, um, but I think we're at the point now where, yeah, I think in the next six months we could have pluggable ref backends. Okay, so. that's, that's nice. And then all the servers would, you know, plug in their super fast, fast whatever storage is. Uh, right, exactly. And when the nice thing about ref storage like that is it's not a compatibility issue in the same way that if, if we end up using some weird proprietary uh, database at GitHub to store the refs. None of the clients have to care about that. The Git protocol becomes a becomes a standardized interface for that. Um, mm -hmm. That being said, I know there is concern. We don't want to proliferate a bunch of gratuitously, you know, incompatible ref backends. We don't want to have 20 SQLite backends, <laughs> or you know, or have a backend that's only available uh, on um, CGit but not on JGit because then people who use both will have you know, that become a pain point I mean, for them. I mean, I imagine it, this would be something highly re relevant for those companies today who are complaining about the scaling issues. Right, yeah. They, they, I mean, they certainly have the resources at hand to go, go in and, and make, uh, you know, whatever uh, backend they, right. they like for it. Right, exactly. Now, keeping in mind, too, that, that large refs is, is but one of the many scaling okay. <laughs> uh, um, problems. 
Yeah, that's one question I want to ask you. Like, what are the other ones? Uh, do you have any other favorites uh, that are high up on the list? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> you did, by the way, mention yesterday that there was like a mail or something where all these things were listed up. Is that something I could link to in the show notes, do you think? Yeah, uh, I, I, I had sent a mail a while ago sort of detailing some of the painful parts of uh, or things that I found slow. All right. Um, and I'll, I'll try and get you that link. But, um, yeah, I mean, so there's sort of three distinct ways scaling areas. I think one is refs. I think one is gigantic blobs, and that's being discussed yeah. uh, actively today, this uh, get, out, get LFS stuff. Um, uh, and then I think the other is just repositories that just, they don't have large blobs, they just are big. They just yeah. have a lot of history and a lot and a the, big The tree. mono repos. Right, exactly. Um, and yeah, they're doing everything right. They're not putting giant binary files in Git or anything like that. They're, they're following all the recommendations, but they've just scaled to a large size. Mm. Um, and there, I think there's a lot of room for um, optimizations within Git. Uh, the bitmaps have been a really important one, but we only use them for serving clones right now. But we could also be using them for things like which tags contain this commit. That's a, that's a question that bitmaps can answer very easily and very quickly, uh, and we don't do that at all on the client side. And um, monorepos are typically more popular at companies that serve their own mm -hmm. uh, repositories. Um, do you at GitHub uh, have monorepos for your own code, or do you have no, users that push, the push manage to push them up there somehow? Right, we serve things like uh, Chromium and, uh, and Blink and these, okay. some of these large repos. Uh, yeah, our own, our own repositories are, uh, we, we're fairly split across a large number of repositories okay. uh, at GitHub. I mean, the, the actual GitHub re repository is uh, much smaller than the kernel, I would say. Okay. So. So it is possible to do it in a, <laughs> yeah, it, in a it, it, neat and orderly fashion. Right, and now we just need to convince all the users to, to <laughs> do it in a neat and orderly fashion, too. Um, which of the uh, ideas or hacks or workarounds that the other companies presented today do you find <laughs> most horrible or most well, appealing? <laughs> yeah, most compelling or most <laughs> disturbing? Uh, you know the the gentleman from Twitter, and I don't remember his name, uh, but he uh, he described a lot of interesting hacks that they were doing. Um, some of them were, were kind of gross, uh, uh, and I think that some of them are things that obviously they're effective for them. But I think there are ways that uh, more elegant ways of approaching the same problems that are, that are harder, that are harder to implement. But for example, uh, they, they found that the bitmaps were not making things fast enough for their clones. Um, and, um, uh, and specifically for their fetches. And that's, there, there are known issues around uh, that, that uh, bitmaps make, uh, in, it can actually make fetches worse uh, in some ways because they, uh, you generate very quickly the list of objects that you need to send, uh, which is what the bitmaps are for. Yeah. But generating that list in the first place wasn't uh, wasn't that bad on a fetch. It's really bad on a clone because you're doing it for all of history. But for a fetch with a small segment of history, that that operation isn't as bad. So you've made it faster. But uh, when you go into the delta compression phase, you want to know, OK, so of the objects I'm sending, uh, they, they may be stored as deltas against other bases in the pack. Uh, and we do a less of a good job of recomputing those deltas, or av avoiding recomputing the deltas when we can, and then when we do have to recompute them, of, of uh, implementing the heuristics around, okay, how do we find a, a new good delta? So I think there's some ongoing work there. Um, there's been some discussion of that on the list. Uh, unfortunately, some of it was probably about a year ago, and, and I haven't picked it up since then, but uh, there's so many optimization topics that it's yeah. sometimes difficult to pick which one to work on. I, I was a bit curious. He should have been here yesterday. Uh, uh, that, uh, we'll have a link to his uh, talk in the show notes, of course. Uh, but they should have been there yesterday, I, I guess, for discussing, because they, they seem to have gone ahead and solved a lot of problems yeah, inside yeah. their own company. Which, uh, uh, you, you're talking about the Twitter now. folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I, um, I, I kind of wish they had been too, and I wish they uh, would uh, send some of their ideas to the, yeah. to the mailing list. I mean, I, I, some of the things, I think I think he knows that some of the things would not be up, accepted upstream yeah. are kind of gross, uh, but I mean, uh, those that we can have the discussions, we can figure out. Uh, you, you know, like I was saying, if if the reason I don't know if the reason that bitmaps were not 
fast enough for them. Was it because of these optimizations that we already know about and just need to implement, or is there something else going on? But I'd really love to to implement those, have him test it, and and mm. see, you yeah. know, see where we get from there. So he mentioned that the, the bloom filters thing could pro probably go upstream. Yeah, that sounds like a really conceptually simple idea. Uh, I'm a little puzzled because the way I understand it to be implemented, I think it might sometimes. Uh, forget to send a ref with with a low probability, but but bloom filters are a probabilistic data structure. And I spoke with him briefly uh, after the talk, and he he said it was that was not the case. And so I think I may be misunderstanding uh, perhaps the way it's implemented. But again, it'd be really awesome if he sent patches to the mailing list, and then we could <laughs> and then we could really discuss it. But you know, uh, there's not enough level of detail in a talk like this to. Uh, to, to really make a technical critique. So yeah, I would love to explore that idea. Yeah. I would love to see patches. I would love to see discussion on the um, list. I mean, he's also not the first one to mention the stuff of I notify uh, mm -hmm. on for Git status. Uh, thoughts? Uh, you know, it, there are some patches on the list. Um, I don't, uh, it's funny, uh, I deal a lot with performance issues, but I deal very much with server-side performance yeah. issues, and the I notify stuff is very much a client-side performance in issue. in the work tree, right? Right, so um, so it's not something that I have a lot of experience with or have given a lot of thought to myself. I know there are iNotify patches. It seems like this is a thing that some people want, but nobody has quite pushed it over the edge of, of getting patches into Git. And I, I don't see any conceptual reason we couldn't. I, I, I know he mentioned dependencies and trying to avoid introducing dependencies into Git. And, I, and that is something we strive for in Git is to not... Uh, uh, have extra dependencies, but if it's an optional feature, then I, that sounds fine to me. <laughs> yeah. Any other things uh, off the cuff that you want to talk about? No, I don't think so. I think we've we've covered most of the the interesting bits. Um, I, I hope uh, I well. Well, there was one topic yesterday, and I imagine you have plugged it already. But uh, there is a new newsletter uh, <laughs> yeah. for for the Git mailing list that, that is trying to summarize the yeah. Git Rev news. So I imagine you've talked about it already, but in case you haven't. Oh, I'm going to talk about it every episode. Every episode. OK, from good, now on good. Is. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I don't know. For myself, I don't, I'm not a compelling reader of, of a newsletter like that because I just read the entire mailing list. Yeah. But at the same time, I recognize that I'm probably in the extreme minority as the person who <laughs> reads all of the emails on the Git mailing list. Might be. Uh, so yeah, so I'm really happy that you guys are, are doing that and providing providing that service to people. Yeah, I, I, I hope that it'll be you know well received, and uh, I don't know maybe we can even uh, you know if some companies who don't really have the you know are working on making workarounds uh, <laughs> like Twitter and and the other companies are doing, you know maybe a newsletter like that would kind of inspire them a bit more. To peek at what's going on inside the, uh, yeah, on the mailing list. I, I do wonder sometimes if the mailing list is a little bit of a closed ecosystem because of uh, because of the volume and the you know and, and the and the content. People don't necessarily want to. It's sometimes difficult to sort of dip your toes in the mailing list, mm. and and a newsletter like that might help people realize that what topics are being discussed that they could jump in on those topics if they wanted to. Mm. Now, I, I didn't get to talk to Sebastian uh, on a related topic, by the way. I was going to ask him about it, but since he uh, he's not here, I'll ask you instead. He, uh, other ways to contribute patches to the mailing list? <laughs> I mean... I think it's a very difficult issue. Um, you know, I uh, we have a culture of review uh, in the Git project, and... We have a very strong culture of of mailing list review. Uh, you know that that mixing, freely mixing patches and comments and proposals and discussion and all these things. Uh, and I think we are really hesitant to uh, to break that up. But at the same time, I think we acknowledge that sometimes getting the patches formatted correctly and sent to the list is an obstacle to to people contributing. And so yeah, so we're I think we're open to. Uh, some of the some of the ideas uh, for for making that easier, whether it's helping to 
to make get send email a little bit friendlier to use, uh, to providing a service that will help sort of translate patches uh, in, for people who have trouble setting up that SMTP servers, translating the patches into a patch series on the mailing list. Mm -hmm. I don't know what form that's going to take. That's another thing, though, that I hope I hope that discussion will continue on the on the list. And yeah. By the way, uh, so the issue was, or the main issue was that Windows uh, people have problems mm -hmm. uh, using send email. Uh, you don't know why or, or anything about the details there, do you? I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I imagine the uh, Perl and Net SMTP dependency might be a, uh, a problem. But even for people on Unix, there's, a, there's an obstacle of uh, you have to manually configure your, your mail setup, yeah. uh, which, can, which can be a little bit of a pain, uh, I think, for some people. Uh, yeah. I know I, uh, at least one person told me that they there isn't a good way of storing your password if you use, say, Gmail, um, and uh, uh, you won't want to have to type in your password every time, but you also don't really want to store your Gmail password in plain text on the hard disk. Yeah. Uh, so I think there's there's some, I mean, that should be a very simple improvement to use the same credential subsystem that the uh, HTTP uh, logins use, uh, so that it would all get cached. And if you were on OSX, it would use OSX keychain. If you're on Windows, there's a, a Windows keychain helper. Mm. Uh, or a Windows Keychain, whatever it's called, WinCred, something like that. I don't know. Uh, uh, so yeah, so I, th I think there are there may be a lot of low-hanging fruit that's just not hitting regular Git developers. But if we're made aware of it, especially if we're made aware of the details, you know, then we can come up with a solution for it. Now, it's a bit embarrassing to admit this, but I was like looking on the mailing list the other day, uh, just a few weeks ago, and I was like th thinking, oh. Oh, patches, patches. I, the patches always look so horrible to me, and I just <laughs> realized that, hey, I, I, I'm not using a monospace font. Here. Oh, yeah, but they look terrible. <laughs> and, and then I was like, whoa, and why didn't I ever do something about this before? And I found some uh, G, uh, Chrome extension that will turn Gmail into monospace, but now all my emails are <laughs> monospace. So. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I, I can't speak to that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm right. you know I, I do everything in a terminal, so I'm I'm all mono space all the time. All right. Well, it looks like people people are about to head out of here and uh, go to the party. So, uh, Pef, thank you very much for talking with me with me once again. Thank you for having me. And that's the end of our Git Merge 2015 series. Since the conference, we've been busy with our monthly Git newsletter, which is called Git Rev News. You can go over to git.github.io to subscribe to it. I'm sure we'll get a nicer URL for it eventually, but uh, until then, that's where it is. Or you can just search online for Git Revenues. Uh, once again, you can find the show notes for this episode on links.gitminutes.com slash 39. And there you can also support the show via Flatter or Karate Pay. Big thanks to everyone supporting the show, including our sponsor, DigitalOcean. Sign up using the promo code gitminutes10. You'll get $10 of credit and you will be supporting the show. You can post feedback or comments directly under the show notes or send me an email on feedback at gitminutes.com. You can follow the show or on Twitter or Google Plus where you'll be notified of any new episodes or head over to gitminutes.com to see all the various colorful ways you can subscribe. Until next time, thank you for listening. <laughs>